What are we to understand about Turkey's um, sort of directions for us? What's, what's it up to? Um, a good, yeah, a good question, and I'll try and answer it uh, in, in a little bit of detail. Um, I think you can trace. I think we can trace a number of phases in the Turkish uh, response to the situation in Syria and its relations to uh, Islamic State. In the initial stage, the Turks, as did many of did many other people, thought that Bashar Assad was going to fall very quickly, and they were extremely happy about it because they thought, as did many of us. <clears throat> that uh, forces which would probably align themselves with Turkey were going to take Damascus. That's to say Sunni Islamist forces, probably associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, would take control of Damascus. It, it feels like ancient history now. And I'm not sure how many people here are sort of students of Syria in a, in a particularly serious sense. But if, you, if there are such among, among us, you'll remember that in the first year or so of the war in Syria, Many of the most powerful militias in the north of the country were associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Liwa Tawhid, if people are familiar with that name, was the most uh, significant among them. The Turks were happy about that because the Turks thought, good, these are the kind of people who will be in favor of uh, AKP and Erdogan and what he's trying to do in Turkey, so it will be a good lookout for the Turks. As a result of that, what the Turks did in the course of the first year of the Syrian civil war is they effectively opened their border, a very, very long border, 900 kilometers. Turkish Syrian border. And the Turks effectively opened it to anybody who wanted to go south to fight against Bashar al Assad. And they didn't care at all what the ideological coloration of that person's views or, or allegiances was. You could be, you know, you could be a Democrat who wanted to establish liberal democracy in Syria. There weren't too many of those things. <laughs> but the Turks wouldn't have minded if you had. And conversely, you all, they also didn't mind if you were a bearded supporter of the Al Qaeda network landing at the airport. Gaziantep with the intention of meeting your friends and taking a van down to the border and crossing over. That was just fine too. As a result, northern Syria became, in the course of the first year of the Syrian civil war, a kind of jihadi playground in which jihadis from all over the region and also all over the world, as it has now turned out, were making their way there to fight initially against the Assad regime and then pretty soon against uh, one another. Now, what that means is that if we're drawing up responsibility, so to speak, for who was responsible for allowing ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra to grab control on the ground in northern Syria in that period, which is what happened, the, the responsibility lies quite heavily, I would say, on the government of Turkey. As I mentioned at the beginning, as a, as a reporter, I crossed that border on a number of occasions. The first time was February 2012. The second time was August 2012 into Aleppo. And on both occasions, it was very clear that the Turkish authorities, the army and the gendarmerie, were making no serious effort whatsoever to stop the movement of anybody. And if they were, all you had to do was get a hundred dollar bill out, and that was the end of the serious attempt to stop you from moving southwards. So the responsibility of the Turks, I think, is, is quite grave, at least on that level of tacit responsibility, whereby they were certainly doing nothing to secure their border, and all sorts of, of dreadful people were trying to get across it. Now, the Turkish official response to this has been to say, look, we've got an incredibly long border of 900 kilometers. We are a, a great country, but to some degree a developing country still. You can't expect us to effectively and hermetically seal a border of 900 kilometers. Now, I don't buy that, and I'll tell you why I don't buy it. And again, it comes back not to stuff I've read on the internet, but to my own experience as a reporter in that area. I don't buy it for the following reason. Because in May of this year, myself and a number of colleagues crossed in for a into Syria from Turkey uh, for an additional reporting expedition, and we crossed into the Kobani enclave controlled by the PKK, or EYD as they call themselves in Syria, as I said. And that, and the, and the border arrangement when you cross into Kobani is absolutely different from that when you cross into Aleppo or Idlib provinces where the Arabs live. When it comes to the Kurds and the PKK controlled in an area, boy do the Turks know exactly how to close a border. <laughs> to make it very, very, very dangerous indeed for anybody who wishes to try and cross it illegally, so to speak. So the argument that well, we just can't seal the border doesn't work. So on the level of tacit responsibility, I think it's clear. The Turks have a tacit responsibility for what has happened in Syria or developed in Syria over the course of the last three years. Finally, however, there is an additional possible layer of evidence pointing to something more than that. And in this, the evidence is more... Uh, slightly more, not, I wouldn't say dubious, but slightly more ambiguous. The 
the Kurdish fighters in the north have come up with photographic evidence which looks like the Turks leaving the border gate open for ISIS when it comes down to fight the PKK. You should be careful of this because it's one source and the source is the PKK. So one needs to treat it with a certain amount of scepticism. Having said that, it's not inconceivable and we should be thinking about the possibility of this. It doesn't mean that the Turks or anyone support Al-Qaeda. It does mean that they, are, they or parts of their state are supremely pragmatic, shall we call it, when it comes to the issue of fighting the PKK. The Turks don't like ISIS very much, but when it comes to the possibility of the PKK establishing independent enclaves in northern Syria facing the Turkish border, with the assumption, a good assumption, that should the peace process between the Turks and the PKK currently underway collapse, that that could be a front for a guerrilla warfare against Turkey, that frightens them very much indeed. Which means that the possibility that they could be at least facilitating the actions of the Islamic State and other fighters when they fight the PKK, that we should take that possibility into account. And just finally to say, my own view is that the Turks would have been willing, or indeed would have been happy, uh, had Kobani fallen to Islamic State in the course of this autumn. Eventually, under enormous pressure from the Americans and others, they allowed Masoud Barzani to send in a number of fighters into that area to help prevent it. But they wouldn't have minded it happening. Had the Turks then, or others, been able to go in and clear out ISIS, maybe that would have been fine too. But first, it would have been better from their point of view if the PKK had fallen. So in short, to conclude, the, the responsibility of Turkey for the situation is heavy indeed. It is certainly a responsibility derived from uh, from a uh, lack of care, a lack of sufficient concern, so to speak, regarding the activities of jihadis in northern Syria, and it may well be something considerably beyond that.